Thank you for attending session 311, titled Turning the Mic on John, a celebration of 10 years of Mormon stories. In this session, Feminist Mormon Housewives podcaster Lindsay Hansen Park will host a Mormon Stories interview with John DeLynn about his most recent Mormon story, being excommunicated from the LDS Church. John DeLynn recently received his PhD in clinical counseling and psychology from Utah State University. He is the creator of several Mormon-themed podcasts, blogs, and websites, including the Mormon Stories podcast. Lindsay Hansen Park is a woman's right, rights activist, a feminist blogger, and an advocate against gender violence. She is the assistant director for the Sunstone Education Foundation and the founder of the Feminist Mormon Housewives podcast. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, NPR, the Los Angeles Times, and many Utah publications. Um, so I'm gonna turn the time over to Lindsay to conduct this interview, and if there is any time after they are finished for Q&A, we ask people to come up to this mic. It's a live mic. We wanna get everything documented and recorded. So if you have any questions, please just form a line um, at the microphone here when it comes to that. All right. Good morning, John. Good morning, Lindsay. I want you to pretend that it's just you and me here today. <laughs> okay. Because I'm so grateful that you decided to meet with me today. So I have some questions for you. And I feel like we should just get started. So uh, number one, do you believe in God, the Eternal Father, and in His Son, <laughs> Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost? And do you have a firm testimony of the restored gospel? It's complicated. Okay, well, actually, uh, I think it's, such, it's so great to be with you today. Ten years. Let's give him a hand for ten years, you guys. And it's kind of adorable to see him nervous. That's because, you know, I'm going to ask him very personal questions about, you know, if he's being chased and uh, looking at pornography, so... Okay, I'm not. I'm kidding. I'm not. I'm not going to do that. Actually, um, I I have a lot of questions as an interviewer, but um, I'm hoping that we can ask some questions that you guys have wanted to know, and if not, you'll be able to talk on the mic. But can you just start telling us about when you started? What was your goal for the podcast? Um. First of all, thanks to all of you for coming on a Saturday morning at 9 a.m. Uh, to, to hear this interview, and thank you, Lindsay, for sponsoring it, and Micah, and for everyone here. Um, uh, so, m many of listeners will probably know that um, when I went through a really kind of serious faith crisis in Microsoft, uh, right around, you know, 2000, 2001, and thereafter, um, I just, it was so difficult, and uh, I went out to uh, a message board at Microsoft of all their internal Mormon employees, and I'm like, did you guys know that Joseph Smith had multiple wives? And, um, and it was a really inappropriate thing to be doing in a workplace. Uh, but that was a testament to how traumatic all this was for me. Um, I was trying to teach seminary, and it was just so awful. And almost immediately, many of these Microsoft employees would ask for kind of time with me and ask uh, for help. And they would disclose, uh, you know, addictions and marital problems and mental illness. And it really, uh, it, was, it was traumatic enough for what happened with me and my own family, but it, it, it didn't take but a month to see how many other people were struggling. And uh, just ironically, I found Sunstone online uh, way back then, and uh, that was an important motivator for me. Uh, uh, you know, I, I found the 10-year anniversary presentations given by the, the September 6th that, that were given at Sunstone in, in uh, 2004. This is right on 2004, 2005. And, um, and they inspired me, really. Um, and. Uh, I, after I tried to talk to my bishop and tried to talk to family members and there was really no one who could understand uh, well enough, I just decided to leave Microsoft and to try and follow the example of the people who had come before me and try and um, make a difference. So um, I, I definitely think the main goal was to help try and 
help people through their transition. I kind of figured that if I, if I could try and process my own transition uh, in a bit of a public way, other people would be able to kind of join me for the ride. And together we would all kind of figure this out and come to a constructive conclusion. It was a bit of a naive endeavor. I also, um, I think I also began with an incentive to help people stay in the church. I had been very much influenced by Lowell Benyon, T. Edgar Lyon, Eugene England, um, uh, people like that. And I felt like if we could just talk about these things, people wouldn't have to leave. And so those are the main reasons I started. So what is it about that, though, that, I mean, people like you and me, we find out this stuff, like, we can't be quiet about it. Most normal people go through the faith crisis. They try to hide it from their family, try to be quiet. Why is it that you had to talk about it publicly? Man, that's a really good question. Um, I, uh, I think, I don't know. I'd have to psychoanalyze myself, and I'm not very good at that. Uh, <laughs> I, think that I think that when my parents were divorced... Um, in middle school that was particularly traumatic for me and um, I think that part of what I felt was that if people could talk more and share openly things they're struggling with that maybe pain could be averted and um, I just I come from a very open family, and it's just part of who I am. And so it was scary, but um, I think I just believe that if, if you can talk things through, um, uh, you can make a difference. And I just wanted to help as many people as possible. That was honestly, it's not that I love attention. It's not that I, I wanted to kind of reap a bit of the whirlwind that I reaped, but I just honestly have always wanted to help the most amount of people with anything I do. So I think it's efficiency more than anything. Yeah. I think you and I are like that. I mean, we've talked about this, about how we've experienced the sickness of staying quiet, right? And so when you do that, you just, you can't stay quiet anymore. So, so that was your goal. Um, you started off just really wanting to help other people understand it, maybe discuss this, help people realize that they have community. Did that change over time? 10 years? Yeah, I definitely went through some pretty severe ups and downs. Um, I, don't think, I don't think the goal of, of alleviating suffering, promoting uh, awareness of difficult issues, and, and encouraging growth, I don't think those goals ever changed. But there were times where uh, I really desperately wanted to find a way to stay personally and to help other people stay. But then there would be interviews that I would have that would really shake me because, you know, you think you, you, think you know Mormon his church history when you're 19, and then you think you know church history when you're 25, and then you think you know church history when you're 31. And uh, sometimes the rabbit hole just keeps going down and down and down. And so some of the interviews that I did were very disturbing to me personally um, and emotionally. And most importantly, once I started traveling around the world, and no matter where I'd go, I'd, I'd be in London, and uh, you know, a friend would reach out to me and say, hey, I'll pick you up at the airport. I will drive you to every business meeting you have. You can stay in my house. All I want to do is to be able to talk to you on the car rides between sort of where you're going. And this happened in China. This happened in Boston. This happened sort of everywhere I went. And, well, and every time the story was the same. Well, it's different, but the same. It's my wife is about to leave me. My, you know, I was anorexic. Um, you know, I'm gay and my wife doesn't know and I'm, I'm thinking about killing myself. Um, and when you just tap into so much pain and suffering, it, it really does make you angry. And I think if I had re regrets, I think it's been the times where I've lost my objectivity, where I've, I've sounded frustrated, but I really do attribute that to just the overwhelming burden of the pain that I was tapping into. 
and the frustration that I didn't see, you know, I think, whole, I think ideally the church would have like saw after a couple years that this was a need and then they would have started filling it because I think we made that pretty obvious in the first year or two, but they didn't. And so I, I think I just started getting really angry about uh, how, how people were allowed to kind of keep suffering. And, and so there were times where I had to really check my motives, whether that was trying to keep people to stay or sometimes where I'm like, I want to burn the whole thing down. And maintaining my attempt at objectivity for as, as well as I may or may not have done, that was one of the hardest things about it. Well, and I want to talk about that for a minute because uh, this idea of like staying or burning things down is like a very Mormon thing, right? It's very binary. It's like <laughs> black and white. And like I'm trying to be the place where like I got both of those going on right now. Um, but you, people ask me how I have avoided so much criticism. And I think, honestly, this is going to sound bad, but I learned a lot from you and your mistakes. <laughs> really? No, 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 no. It's true. You were one of the first that had to go had to go out there and do this, and you have taken an amazing amount of criticism. And one of the things that people criticize you for is maybe flip-flopping or going back and forth. And when John changes his mind or changes his position, the internet loses its mind, <laughs> right? Which is absurd to me, because as we're talking, it's a journey and it's this process, and every single one of us in here feels one way about things on a certain day and other factors come in. So let's talk about that criticism and how it affected you because you have had a lot, I mean, you've had a lot of praise, so not to, not to say that people don't like you, but let's talk about the criticism and the, and the mean things people have said and done as you're going through this journey and as you're quietly behind closed doors dealing with people who are calling you and wanting to commit suicide at 3 a.m. in the morning and waking you up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there have been some really, really, really hard things said. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the worst. One was, I think, when an, uh, when an apologist kind of accused me of, like, spiritual... They called me, like, a spiritual Jack Kevorkian. Um, oh, golly. Um, People are fun. They're just fun. Um, I think, uh, there was some comment about, oh, a, a lot of comments about being bipolar or schizophrenic or, you know, grandiosity, calling me a meteor whore. I mean, honestly, I understand where people are coming from when they say things like that, that this is all about attention. Um, th those are some of the hardest things, I think. Um... But uh, I always go back and forth on that because I think I have at least enough introspection to know that if you put yourself out there, if you make yourself a public figure, if you jump into the arena, you can't really whine and complain when people uh, are hurt, especially when you're dealing with issues as sensitive as religion. So I think that's been an overriding thought that I have to remind myself of. Um, Sometimes I, I, I've deserved the criticism. Most of the time, I think I've deserved a lot of criticism um, as well. Um, but, you know, one of the weird things I think, I don't think that a lot of the listeners hung in for hundreds of episodes to learn about what Joseph Smith did in this or that time period or to, you know, to fixate on this or that. I do think that I do think that people really, just kind of like reality TV a little bit, I think people sometimes got a little bit fused with my story as I was going through the interviews, and they would kind of be with me in the highs and lows. And if I was sort of really favorable for the church, but then I would take a downturn, I think they would, I think many people would just kind of take that personally, like it was an affront on where they were. And if somebody, um, and, and most importantly, if, if I was really, Feeling good about the church, I think that would make others who weren't able to make the church work feel very angry, um, like I was selling out, or or like I was, um, like I was giving people false hope or something. So, I think I think it's been deeply sad and difficult at times to be criticized. I do think I've developed some thick skin, but but um, I think I understand where the criticisms come from. 
I don't think I, I really blame people. And, um, and I do have to say that the generosity and the kindness overwhelms the negativity, as is, is, is much negativity as you may have witnessed or I may have witnessed, um, the, the generosity and the kindness floods and overwhelms the negativity. Well, when I first met you, I was in the faith crisis mode, and it was crisis, I mean, it was a crisis. And I did this thing where, like, you, I transferred all my prophet leadership worship to you, right? <laughs> And I hate to say this, but like a lot of Mormons do this. It's like a Mormon thing. Don't do this, Mormons. So, and then, you know, I met John as, as like a guy. And like, um, if I saw John make a mistake or do something I didn't like, I was like, what? Faith crisis all over again. And so we've talked about this a lot. This, this, how people make um, people prophets and that kind of thing in the community. Do you feel a sort of responsibility to the community? Because... I've noticed like you're, you're authentic and you share your authentic goals, but there's this whole audience that rides with it. So do you feel a responsibility to like maybe separate and have a public persona versus a private one? Do you have conflicts with the authenticity there? I know that uh, a lot of people that struggle with this question on how to be authentic and um, sincere and honest while not you know, taking, taking everyone for the ride. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um... It is, it is, it has been weird. Um, it is, it's been hard to, to have people, um, yeah, to have people be so generous and kind sometimes in, in what they have to say, because I'm so aware of our history, and I'm so aware of the ways that leaders in the past have taken advantage of that in ways that aren't useful. And it's a very heady thing to, you know, it's a very heady thing to be uh, in China or in Home Depot or wherever and to have someone, or, or like um, Central Park, you know, and to have someone recognize you and to like tell you that you saved their life or you changed their life. And for me, this really, this really came to a head in 2011 when I started holding Mormon Stories conferences. Um, regional, you know, regional meetings, and we traveled to various cities, and it, it was really hard because I, I, I wanted to help. The, the most important thing I wanted to try and do was to build community, because I knew, even as a mental health professional, that I'm not going to be healing people. Right? I can help them find healing to some degree, but what was really going to heal people was them finding others like them, face to face lunch to lunch, soul to soul, heart to heart, and building little communities of support. And so when I started these little conferences, that was a major goal, was to help build up something in Phoenix and build up something in Boise and build up something in Salt Lake City and Washington, D.C. So that people, because I couldn't, I, I, I couldn't, I have 60,000 unread emails to this date. I, I, there's no way that I could have reached all the people. Um, but then when we'd have these conferences and we'd end with people sharing their sort of uncorrelated testimonies, people would like bear their testimonies about me. Yeah, and on the one hand, it's, it's incredibly exhilarating. I mean, you, you just can't imagine how, you, maybe many of you can in your various respects, but you can't imagine how incredibly exhilarating it feels to have people treat you like I'm sure some small degree what they've treated other leaders, you know? And it, it, it can really go to your head very quickly. Um, and I just, and by, by 2012, uh, you know, there were a lot of things happening, but part of it was, uh, it just became too much for me personally. And in 2012, uh, my family started to fall apart and Margie and I started to wonder whether we were gonna be able to make it and yeah, I started, I, I made some really big mistakes um, during that time period. Uh, mistakes I thought I'd never make. And, um, and that's, you know, it was a hard decision to pull the plug at the time on those communities and on those conferences. I feel like I really hurt a lot of people. Uh, we had so much momentum. I think Mormon Stories 
grossed like $200,000 that one year. I didn't take that as income. There was a lot of expenses in running these conferences, but um, there's so much momentum and so much excitement, and it was such a rush. But I also knew that I, I wasn't sure I was big enough for that task, and I, I withdrew because I did not want to create the same problems that so many people had been facing in their lives. I didn't want to recreate it, and I knew that I could be taking people down that path. So that was a really hard hit for me um, and for everyone. And I do apologize to everyone that I hurt during that time, including my own family. Um, All the John DeLynn faith crises you started? I did, I did. I disappointed a lot of people um, for a lot of reasons. But um, I was, to be honest, one of the crazy things is as you face sort of your biggest nightmare, as you disappoint the people you love and people who put faith in you, um, uh, there was a sense of relief because I knew that I was disabusing them of the notion that I deserved that type of worship. And that was an important thing for me to kind of face and to stick with because I said, what's the best way to get rid of this problem? It's, it's, to, it's to sort of lay it all out there and, and be crucified, so to speak. And... And so, yeah, to the, uh, you know, people are still very generous, but I think, I think we dodged a bullet a little bit um, in avoiding, avoiding what could have been a lot worse. So. so you brought up money, and I want to talk about money because Mormons get super weird about money, right? <laughs> Everything's supposed to be free. We have lay leadership, right? We don't, we don't have leaders that take money. And so <laughs> when... when uh, People ask for donations online. I've experienced this myself. I've noticed that's another thing that people lose their minds about. So, uh, do you want to talk about do you want to talk about that a little bit? Um, just about how you ask for donations and sort of the criticism you had for that. Because I'm a big big advocate and defender of you with this, obviously, because I ask for donations too. But um, in feminism, it's a big principle. People should get paid for the work that they do, and it's work. So talk about some of the criticisms you got. When I started, um, when I started Mormon Stories, I, I was just, I had a, I had a, um, honestly, I had just sort of lost a position at Utah State around 2005. And, you know, I'd gone, I'd gone from making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year at Microsoft to making like $10,000 a year. And I had four kids and it was just, you know, to buy equipment and all the time I was spending, you know, I at least needed to recover my costs. And so that's how the donations started. I felt like that was fair. Um, and that, and, and honestly, the generosity was, was really quite significant. So that within the first couple of years, I, you know, I think it started to grow to like $5,000, $10,000, even $20,000. And that, you know, that, that would have been less than $5 an hour. That would have been like a dollar an hour for my efforts. And, and the money that I could have made, I mean, having worked for Microsoft, having worked for MIT, the amount of money that I could have made, it wasn't about the money at all. But when my wife and my kids are missing me and I'm traveling all the time, having a little bit of money come in just makes, makes Margie and the kids kind of feel like it's not just all sacrifice, like there's at least a little bit of compensation. Um, and then, then when I went back to school, like in 2009, I decided to go back and get my PhD. I had shut down Mormon Stories. But they offered, you know, they offered the university students this horrible trade where it's like, we'll, we'll pay you $10 an hour to teach a course or to be a research assistant. And you just can't survive on that money. And I just thought, crud, you know, I, could, I can teach this class to 30 students. Or like, I could bring Mormon Stories back. The pain didn't stop. I could bring Mormon stories back and try and help thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people. I could help save marriages. I could help prevent suicide. I could help prevent, you know, depression and anxiety. And so I, I really, it was just a total act of faith and trust. And I just said, listeners, I don't know if any of you remember that episode where I, where I made that offer. I just said, if you guys will support me, I won't take an assistantship. And at the time, that's a big deal. You don't get a tuition reimbursement if you take an assistantship. And, um, you know, I'm putting myself at the mercy of you guys who didn't pay 
directly for the, what you received and who could cancel at any time. So I feel like I took a big risk and, and my listeners were extremely generous. And all I can say is I, I don't think people would have paid for something they didn't maybe find valuable. And I, um, I, I'm super grateful that money went directly to, I was not, I didn't, I did my best to make sure that there would be no questions about the use of the money. From the start, I said, this money will go to food on my table. Methamphetamines. It will go to... That was good. Meth. That came later. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, no, but I, I did. I used the money for food, groceries... I had to provide my own health insurance for, for my family of, of six, um, home repairs. I mean, that's, that's what the money went for. And I, I hope you feel, for those of you who contributed, I hope you feel like what you received was worth what you contributed. Well, that brings up another question because you talked about your family and I don't want you to go into too much because I know, um, you know, they deserve the right to tell their own story. But just in, I'm the same way that the donations that I get are really for my family to be like, hey, mom's not crazy. She's like actually doing something. Uh, so talk about the impact that this has had on your family as, to the extent that you can. I mean, uh, as I've already alluded to, um, Mormon stories almost, you know, I, I, my parents were divorced. That's kind of what defined me growing up. Um, the last thing I ever wanted to do was to have that happen in my family. Um, and even though, um, even though Margie and I had a really tough first seven years and ups and downs for the next seven to ten years, um, we both brought to our marriage a lot of I guess trauma from our past lives that made us both really scared to fully trust each other. Um, and so the hardest part about Mormon stories was the fact that I derived so much strength from all of you. When you would reach out and talk to me, it made me feel worthwhile. It made me feel validated. And all that time, Margie was sort of in her own way screaming out to me saying, pay attention to me. You know, why can't, why can't you care enough? Why can't you care as much about me as you care about your listeners? Why can't you talk to me? Why can't you listen to me with the same level of focus and attention that you give your listeners? And with all the travel and all the distractions, like I said, in, by 2011, 2012, we were, we were very close to calling it quits. Um, and... Um, to some extent, my kids were shielded from a lot of this, but over time, it started to bleed into my kids' lives. And honestly, it's hard enough to be a teenager, to have, uh, to have your dad be in the newspapers and people start whispering things about your dad. It is a really traumatic thing for your kids. The, the happy side of that that uh, I can say with, with total truth and conviction is that once Margie and I hit the really, really hard spots, um, 2012, 2013, um, it, was, it was sink or swim. And if any of you noticed that I pulled back, I stopped answering emails, I became a lot more insular. Um, it's because I was investing in my marriage. And Margie and I, for the first time, were um, learning to be vulnerable with each other and learning to trust each other. Um, my work and my PhD, which you guys funded, gave me maybe a little bit of insight into some of my blind spots. And that helped me maybe gain a little bit more of the perspective that would allow me to work and heal my marriage. Um, and as painful as it's been, um, Marty and I, for the past two or three years, have had an amazing love affair. Um, and she's my soulmate. Gross. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. TMI. TMI. I'm kidding, Margie. I love I you. No, it's okay. Um, it's true. And as hard as uh, 
she's my soulmate now. And, and more, I have more stories to thank for that, honestly. And while it's been really hard on my kids, um, I, think, I think my children, I think it's been good for them, as, as much weakness as we have, I think it's been good for them to see their parents stand up for things they believe in. And, you know, you think teens would immediately get it, or even children, but they don't. They're just like, I don't want to deal with this, Dad. I don't want people bugging you while we're at McDonald's. We don't go to McDonald's. When we're at the, you know, I don't want people, when we're at the movies, I don't want to have to stand while people come up to you, and, or I don't want to have to go to school. And You know, they don't, they don't understand, even though you think they do. But over time, as I've seen them kind of mature, I do think, I do think they have perceived... Um, their parents as being people who are willing to stand up for those who, who maybe are struggling or in need of support. And I think, I think they see parents who went through hard things and are willing to become stronger as a result. And, and I think that they share a lot of the values that Mormon Stories has tried to engender. A love and appreciation for uh, LGBT people, for women's issues, for truth and openness and honesty and candor. And I, you know, I have to believe, and maybe this is self-delusion, but I have to believe that my kids are better for having been through that. So it's bittersweet, but I think it's good overall. I'm sure it is. Well, I want to ask about the excommunication and how that affected you and your family, and I, like, I have more questions, but I think that there's probably gonna be a lot of questions here. So let's talk about the excommunication, what it was like going for it. You know, one of the things I heard was John courted his excommunication and uh, was asking for this, and um, I have a lot of thoughts on excommunication, but that's, we don't have time for that. So let's talk about the excommunication leading up to it, if you felt like you were really poking the bear and asking them to excommunicate you, and then how it affected you and your family afterwards, and if you were surprised at how you felt. Yeah, the minute I bought the microphone, you know, I'm sitting there in 2005, I don't know anything about podcasting, I met, you know, a musician's friend or whatever it is, and I'm like, oh, what's a microphone that I should buy, you know? Um, the immediate thought that came into my head was the September 6th. I mean, I was at BYU when the September 6th were excommunicated. I, I, I saw them hold a little meeting at a, at a Provo hotel, like a press conference with Paul Toscano and others, sort of advocating for, I think it was academic freedom at BYU, but that was a very tumultuous time and it was, it was in my memory. I had watched you know, uh, the videos of Levina and Michael Quinn and Maxine and the others um, share their experiences. And when I was at BYU, they seemed really scary and kind of dangerous to me. Um, you, you know, I was curious, but I was still very conservative in certain parts of my brain. But after I watched their 10 years reflection on their excommunications, I saw them as heroes. It was a lot like Malcolm X. Like in high school, they had taught me that Malcolm X was this evil, wicked, violent person. But then I read his autobiography and I'm like, oh my gosh, I totally get why he was angry, you know? And I get why he did the things he did and I saw him as courageous. It was a very similar thing with the September 6th. And so how could I not have that on my mind the very first moment that I bought the microphone? So yeah, I felt like I was poking the bear from the very moment that I started Mormon Stories. But nothing happened for nine years, right? Um, I mean, Obviously, there were times where my bishop would, you know, call me in and say, I'm hearing hard things, but then I would reach out to you guys and say, send emails or letters about how I've helped you stay in the church, and I would get hundreds and eventually thousands of emails and letters. So I'm like, you know, and so over time, I felt like they're, they're not going to do anything. You know, this is kind of cool. Like, we were past that. I mean, I really felt like we were past that. Um, and then, uh, and then for me, it all kind of unraveled um, in 2013, the fall of 2013, um, if I have my dates right. That was when, you know, Proposition 8 had happened. We had gone through, you know, a couple Romney campaigns or whatever. And um, 
I, it seemed like the church had really backed off of opposing same-sex marriage, of, you know, it started opening up with its history. It started being more candid. And I'm like, we're moving in the right direction. And as I would sit in church with torment about how can I stay? What about the people suffering? What do I do? What I said to myself in my mind is, as long as, as, long as the church is moving in the right direction, and I could be 100% open with how I think and feel, that's a tax, I'm, then I'm willing to pay the tax of my affiliation with the church, with my support of the church, even with some of my tithing. I'm willing to pay that tax because I'm benefiting from my affiliation. I love being a Mormon. I love, my, my family's benefiting from it. And if I'm open and vocal um, and the church is moving in the right direction, then everything's fine. But in 2013, Elder Oaks gave a really disappointing talk for me in general conference. And it was basically kind of retrenching on the whole traditional family thing. And I just, you know, that's when I typed Oaks Fail on a Facebook post. I just, I just said, that's not going to be acceptable. I, I, if I stay a member, if I give money, if I give time, and they're going to continue either retrenching or moving in the wrong direction, then I, I have to, I, I don't know, I just I kind of lost my temper a little bit. So that's when I gave my TED talk. Um, that's when I uh, created my ordained women profile. And it wasn't two months from my ordained women profile and my TED talk that my bishop called me in in January of 2014 and said, we're starting an investigation. Um, and he specifically mentioned ordained women and a website that I created called Progressive Mormons as the reason for why he was starting the investigation. Women are scary, man. Yeah, women are scary. Yeah. Yeah. So I did get more strident. Um, but, but when I wrote that comment, Oaks Fail, I expected like, you know, people, some people not to like it. But the, the incredible backlash I received from just simply making a really modest, what I felt, a modest criticism, I felt like it was disproportionate and kind of scary. And I thought, wow, if people are so scared to even make subtle criticisms that are public and named, that's a problem in and of itself. And so I said, I'm going to be publicly open about my doubts and disbelief more than I ever have. I'm laying it all out on the table. And when I feel like the brethren merit criticism, I'm going to offer it. And, you know, that's when it all that's when the heat That's came. That's when your love affair, and you started to court <laughs> your church court, and your love affair with your court of love began. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a romance. It's, it's romantic. But the crazy thing is, I, um, we remained active in the church up through that uh, June. Um, and then when they called the disciplinary council, that's when things got crazy. But just to, that was a really long answer, but the excommunication was a terrible thing. It's inhumane. Uh, it's dehumanizing. Uh, it's it's so impersonal. They don't look you in the eye. They don't they don't show genuine love. They don't have any interest in what you have to say, or what you feel, or what's your journey. When they gave us a little bit of time to talk, they would the 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 the, the high council. They'd stare off into the distance. They they would put up a blockade so that they wouldn't have to actually feel anything about your story. Why did you go? Um, I just felt like, I, for me, I understand why people don't go. For me, it almost felt like a ritual. I, if, if they were gonna do it, I wanted them to look me in the eye, which they didn't, but I wanted them to look me in the eye. And I wanted to go through it. I wanted to have closure for myself. And honestly, I'm so glad I attended my excommunication because it was completely validating. If they had treated me with genuine, sincere love, if they had felt, if they had really listened, if they had, and they're good men. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trashing them as bad men. But if they had shown Christ-like love and empathy and listened, then I would have like really been shaken by that and had pause of like, let's try and make this work. But the degree, just the procedure, just the, 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 the shaming, public shaming, the deceptions of how they, it was a completely deceptive process with the church PR and the apologists and even the state president 
trying to say it was about these things in public when he, t and I, you know, I have the recordings, I can share them at some point. It's very, I've shared some of them, like, it's very clear why they were doing it and they weren't honest about it. And what I'm saying is that whole process was very much cathartic for me because it validated my decision. And I knew that this was not, this was not of God. This was not of God. This is not something Christ would approve of. And that made me feel better about it, um, honestly, in the end. And the only other thing I'll say is that I was carrying incredible cognitive dissonance for 10 years, trying to bridge that gap between belief and, and non-belief. And it was, a, it, was a, it was very cathartic for me. to. I, I would not have let the church go. I love it too much. But they almost did me a favor because they had set me free. And I am no longer uh, burdened by the cognitive dissonance and the pain and the suffering and the confusion. And it's life after has been awesome. Well, I, I'm going to ask one more question and then I'll let you take over because this is Mormon stories. We're going to go three more hours. Kidding. <laughs> Actually, it's really, it's really difficult to only ask one more question. So we're skipping over a lot of stuff I'm sure people want to know about. But John, is there anything that you want to tell your listeners after 10 years? Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, Other than, uh, other than the private and the personal things that I share with my family, um, being able to create this podcast with you has been uh, the most meaningful and uplifting and important and powerful part of my life. Um, this has been a community effort. I couldn't have done it without the, the guests who came on Mormon Stories. I couldn't have done it without the people who send me emails to share their feedback and their thanks and appreciation. I couldn't have done it without the, the people who served on my board and the volunteers who helped make it happen. And I couldn't have done it without the financial support and encouragement. And I, uh, I think we did something important over the past 10 years. I, uh, I, think we, I think we did help influence um, the direction of the church modestly, but more importantly, I think we alleviated the pain and suffering of a lot of people. And I think the, the piece of feedback that I get most from people, they never use these words, but it's how I interpret it, they say, Thank you for giving me my life back. I, I was just locked in, and I wasn't aware. And now, whether they stay in the church or leave, they say, now I have the freedom to, to think for myself. I've got all the information. I have a community that can support me. I have lots of validation. And now I can live whatever life I really want to live with whatever, however many years I have left. Some people only have 20 or 30. Some people have 50, 60, 80 years left of their lives. And that's been an incredible gift to work with all of you to give that gift to others. So thank you. Everybody, John Dillon. All right, thank you, Lindsay and John. All right, let the line form. We've got about 10, 15 minutes. John. Oh, is that not working? It's the one mic I didn't check. Here. <laughs> John, is there a God? Is there a God? Um, honestly, uh, I... Nothing would, I mean, honestly, I love life. And so I want, I want to continue existing. Who doesn't, right? I mean, maybe some people don't, but I do. I love life. So, uh, 
you know, the thought of everything ending when I die, there are parts of me, you know, that would be super sad about that. But, um, but two things, I, a couple things. I don't think anybody really knows, honestly. I think we all hope. Some of us hope, some of us don't. So, um, so I hope there's, I hope things continue. I hope we all continue. I hope that we're all partying um, after this whole existence is through in the afterlife. I really do. Um, uh, but, but if this is all we have, and it, it is very, it's very possible to me that this is all we have, then how grateful I am that now every minute that I have I can enjoy in the present moment and that I can, I can direct it and enjoy it as it is. And, and, and even if this is the only life we get, I still think it's a beautiful and a miraculous and a wonderful life. And so all I have to do is just sort of say I don't know about an afterlife or a God. I hope there's something. Maybe I even have a little bit of faith that there's something. But I'm, I'm more and more at peace with, with this being good enough, at least for now. You're gonna, you're, the apologists are going to cite that, and you're going to see Eat, Drink, and Be Merry, John DeLynn, Sunstone Interview, 2015. <laughs> you're welcome. Thank you. John, I'm, I am very appreciative of the help that you have given people who have struggled in Mormonism. For me, I had what alcohol counselors call a high bottom. Uh, I got out of my Mormonism without a whole lot of the baggage that a lot of other people have. But I want to thank you for an aspect of what you have done that may not be apparent to most of the people here today. As a historian, I appreciate what you have done in about 600 podcasts to create primary sources that we historians can use uh, in the future when we're uh, investigating various aspects of Mormonism. You. Uh, interviewed people on the left, the center, and the right of Mormonism. You interviewed Sandra Tanner and Mike Quinn. In the middle, you've interviewed Richard Bushman and Terrell Gibbons. On the right, you've interviewed Dan Peterson. Okay? And there's this whole trove of sources that we can go back to if we have a computer and generate uh, quotes and sources and things like that. So you're a psychologist, I'm a historian, you have helped my profession. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. You. I'll just note that John Larson's, John Larson's in the back, and I think he deserves our, our thanks as well. As does one female badass podcaster right here. Should I start over again? Kiss the mic. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. We recently left the church, and you are very helpful in helping us, you know, get our heads out of the sand, so thank you very much. But our question is, is, or my question is, we, the one thing that we were kind of affected by a little bit is we had really close friends and neighbors, and they acted like we just were dead. Like, they had no interaction with us whatsoever. So my question is, how has your journey affected you and with your relationships with your friends and neighbors? Yeah, it's really, it's really creepy to be excommunicated in a Utah neighborhood. <laughs> At least it was for me, because these people we've lived with for 11 years. We are, they, they were there for difficult times. Our kids babysat their kids. We shared a lot of tender moments. And as soon as you get excommunicated, uh, I, I think I understand what happens to them. It's, you know, whether it's Scientology or Jehovah's Witness or the military, the most dangerous people are the ones who defect. 
because they cause the people remaining to question whether they should remain. So what they do psychologically is they erect walls. That's what they have to do. And I don't think they're monsters. I don't think they're mean. But just the chill and the silence and the distance is really disturbing. I think biologically we're wired to feel really troubled by that because, you know, a thousand, maybe even a couple hundred years ago, let alone thousands of years ago, that probably meant they killed you. You know what I mean? If the, if the community felt that way about you, right? And so it's really, you know, a lot just creepy in our ward and in our community. Um, my family's been, all my family, my immediate, my parents and my siblings all remain active in the church. It's kind of crazy. Um, but they've been very delightful. I have privilege that way. Many people aren't able to do what we've done because they don't have the parents and the siblings that I had. Um, but uh, my, my family relationships are great and I have many, many, so many thousands of beautiful friends that that offsets the disadvantages by a large amount. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, John. Um, my, my question is about, I'm trying to talk into the mic. Uh, my question is about the correlation between you having what appeared to seem a pretty great job at Microsoft and from a third party perspective, having you know, less income directly correlated with your faith crisis. I know many of us don't have like this glee when we have a faith crisis, what we have is, is more hard times. What, would you, what advice would you give to people who have maybe career setbacks or other social setbacks um, in the face of criticism from faithful members saying, well, it's because you're going through a faith crisis that these, these problems exist? In my case, my faith crisis happened when I was making a lot of uh, really good money. So for me, that wasn't, that wasn't uh, a correlation. But, I, but I, it's, it's one of the most awful things when people are blamed, uh, you know, a death in the family or a sick child or a bad financial situations, and then the believing members sort of put that on you. Um, I don't know. There's so much I could say. Uh, I, you, know, you know, to some extent, follow your heart. That's important. You're being courageous. Try and understand that from their point of view, they're not really meaning the words they say. Anytime you hear those words come out of their mouth, what they're really saying is, I'm scared. I'm just really scared for myself. They're not even as scared for you as they are for themselves. So try not to take that personally. It really isn't. It's not about you at all. When they say those things to you, it's not about you. I know it's hard to muster that fortitude. But the other thing I'd have to say is, try and look at this as a birth of freedom. If you don't believe that the church is what it claims to be, even if you're struggling financially, what I hope you'll realize is the gift you now have of the rest of your life. And it may be difficult, it may be challenging to, to create and forge that new path as a new pioneer, but it's a huge gift. You're alive, you're conscious, you have free will, and Find what you, I'll be talking about this this afternoon. Find your passion, something that you love and believe in and would do even if you didn't get paid for it. And then do that. And you will find your way, you know? And you will have more joy than you ever would have had if you hadn't have left. That's my quick feedback. Yes. Okay, so uh, the four of you that are waiting to give questions, those will be our last four questions and then we'll wrap up after that. Um, this, we got a lot of people in here, and the next session starts at 10.15, so please exit the room quickly so we can all make it to the next session, and so the next session here can get set up. Go ahead, Russ. It's nice to finally meet you. Thank you, Russ. We tried to meet. It didn't work. I really like you. I particularly like that your computer has the symbol of the biggest sin in monotheism, <laughs> the white out of the apple. I love sunstone. I love sunstone. I come because of everybody here. And so my question is, I'm a retired chaplain. I wore a cross on my shirt for 23 years. I did what you do. Walking up to me at airports in Central Park, I get that. I'm also a scholar of terrorism and why people become terrorists. My question is 
says, from what I've seen and experienced today, you have a huge amount in common with Douglas MacArthur, Elmer Gantry, Jim and Tammy, Oliver North. I can keep going. So what do you do? Elmer Gantry? Yes. Wow. Elmer Gantry. So what are you doing to prevent yourself from becoming one of those? Because I like you, and I like that you are here. But where I went to my undergraduate training, we were steeped in never becoming a nation of sheep. Don't create a flock. Or is that your intent? I feel like you have way better hair than those people. <laughs> better hair? Yeah. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Russ. Well, I tried to address that in my comments about how I stopped the conferences and the communities. Um, I'll, just, I'll just tell you this, Russ, and anyone else concerned. Um, I, it's amazing that I have six years of formal training as a clinical and counseling psychologist, and I... I'm not leaving the profession triumphantly that I'm gonna be saving all these souls. It's humbling to sit in that chair and to stare someone in the eye and to have them say, fix me. Because you really want to, but you know, they're either gonna get better or not, you know? And they don't always get better. Um, even the best of therapists will tell you that. Um, and really, really quick, you learn that your job isn't to heal anybody. Your job isn't, you can't save anybody. Um, the best you can do is listen and validate. And occasionally you can give a tip or a suggestion or help them develop insight, right? Occasionally there's a technique that may help a little bit, mindfulness or whatever. But, but... The power of the individual is so limited. And the power of community is so great, you know? And so, um, the, one of the, my favorite movies of all time is Kumare. Not because I cried during the movie, but because of the theme that the movie gives you, which is be your own guru, right? And that's my message as a mental health professional. That's my message as a podcaster. We don't need more gurus. And, um, and so uh, I will commit to you to do my best to not be that guy and to help all anyone who wants to develop their own wisdom and their own insight. And that's my commitment. And so that's, I'll tell you that. And if I, if I stray, I welcome your feedback, Russ. You can come to Cash Valley. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Is now it. a good time to talk about the compound that we're building? Oh. <laughs> Yes, is it Texas? Where's the we compound? We have good news. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, it seems that, uh, as you've discussed and, and throughout your journey, you've received a lot of criticism that you've been surprised by. You, it, it seems like you've, you've been misunderstood, um, that people are telling a different story about you than the one that you tell about yourself. But depending on what sources people read, that's the only side they're going to hear. They're not going to hear your side. So. You've, you've tried to create a lot of great things, and even in the best of intentions, they've been misinterpreted. They, they haven't gone as well as you've, you've liked. Do you ever try to compare yourself to, for example, like church leaders or the early church to see, you know, maybe they were trying with the best of intentions, or maybe people are trying with the best of intentions now. So things that are really hurtful now, even though it seems like it's very intentional, that, that, that people are hurting and it's being purposeful, do you ever think that maybe that there's a different side and there's just a big miscommunication? I do. Thanks, George. And thanks for your blog posts over the years. You've been an important voice, an important influence. Um, I hope that you've heard me say multiple times, I hope you've heard me express empathy for the brethren. I hope you've heard me say that they probably have one of the hardest jobs in the world. I hope you haven't heard me take too many unfair pot shots at them. Um, because that has been my goal, to have empathy for them during this entire process. Uh, I, I absolutely, you know, I met with Elder Holland on two occasions. 
I met with Marlon Jensen for a one and a half hour, two hour lunch. Those men do believe what, what they're preaching and saying. And I believe they have very difficult jobs. And uh, I, I believe that they deserve respect and um, empathy. Uh, and so uh, it's a great question, George, and I think we all deserve that, really. And, um, and so I take my lumps, they take their lumps. Hopefully uh, we all get um, some praise and satisfaction along the way. And in the end, I just hope we all move forward towards a better understanding. And I think that's what it's about, and I think we are. I think the past 10 years have been healthy for Mormonism, for Mormons, for ex-Mormons, for post-Mormons. And so I appreciate that reminder, and I share with you the importance of empathy for everybody. Will there be an episode 500? <laughs> episode 500. I want that to be like, you know how like, you know, like uh, when Paul was dead and the Beatles, you know, <laughs> Like, I want that to be like some secret, you know, nugget uh, that people always ask about. No, my intention was to release the Tom Phillips episode as, as 500, um, but it was five parts and I didn't want it to be 500 A, B, C, and D. My also intent was to create this sort of new vision for the next 500 episodes, but I got so overwhelmed by trying to make it meaningful that I just, I just, uh, I gave up. So that's just going to be one of those rare oddities that people ask about, kind of like a bootleg album or something in a, in a rock band. Thank you for asking. Um, I was wondering how the process of making Mormon stories has changed since your excommunication. Um, you know, technically it's been the same, like in terms of the technology that we use. Um, I, it's hard for me, I, well, you know, Terrell Givens won't come on Mormon Stories anymore. Fiona Givens won't come on Mormon Stories anymore, as far as I know, you know? If, if I'm wrong, I'll be delighted, right? Many apologists won't come on Mormon Stories anymore, and that's kind of what they did to Sunstone. When Sunstone started getting too much attention, too successful, the, the comments against Symposia, the comments warning people, the September 6th, the excommunications, the most significant thing that that did is it made all the faithful people scared to attend, all the BYU and CES employees unable to attend, and it becomes this self-fulfilling prophecy where you appear to become more imbalanced and more strident and more angry, which partly is because of how they react to you, but it's partly because of what, what they do. And so it's, it's really sad for me that, that Richard or Terrell won't come back on. I hope I'm wrong, I hope they will. Um, I, don't know, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to keep the balance that I kept before, I'd like to, but part of me is just really tired of asking someone about the truth claims and how they believe. I'm kind of just really tired of that now. And Mormon Stories has always been what interested me. And I hope that if it interested me, it would interest you. And so I have to figure out, it's very difficult, I'd love your feedback. I have to figure out how to keep it interesting now that we've done 550 whatever episodes of things that you're all very familiar with. So if you have feedback for how I can keep it balanced and interesting, please flood my inbox. I'm done with my PhD now. I'll be able to answer your emails better. And I would welcome another 500 episodes if together we can do something really constructive and meaningful. But I'm not interested in it becoming one-sided, angry, negative, an ex-Mormon podcast. That just holds no interest for me. And so I would look to you as the community to say, if we want there to be 500 more, let's do it. Help me figure out how to do that. And if it's time to kind of ramp it down, it will have been a wonderful, beautiful ride. And so, uh, thank you, Lindsay, for this interview. Thanks, Micah, for moderating. Thanks to all of you here today, and thanks to all those listening and viewing for supporting Mormon Stories. It's been the most beautiful gift of my life, and I'm honored to have walked this path with you all. Thank you.
everybody stay for the next session. It's going to be awesome.